to have uh, such a discussion is because psychosis is, is, is a word that is literally more than 100 years old. Um, and it's commonly used, it's, it's kind of taken a life of its own in the culture. And over the course of a century, the meaning and the connotation, the usage of a word will change. Uh, so, so psychosis is a word that is so common that we all think we're familiar with it, but actually if you think very deeply about it, you'll find that um, it might, might not be the case that uh, two or three people have the same picture in their mind, what exactly is meant when they say that psychosis is present. And sorry about that. And uh, secondly, um, if you if you if you scan or uh, scour the DSM for a standardized operational definition of psychosis, and you find one, please send me an email uh, and tell me what page it's on because I can't I can't find it. And as far as I you know my studies of DSM, it's always been like mentioned as a thing, but never formally defined in the way that they have defined schizophrenia itself or delirium or manic episodes or major depressive episodes or obsessions or you know all, all these commonly used terms have operational definitions in the dsm but to my knowledge psychosis is uh, surprisingly absent in terms of um, getting such treatment and finally i think it's worthwhile to talk about psychosis and understand psychosis because many of our patients as you know will be suffering from symptoms of psychosis and i think it can be challenging uh, to explain to an affected person uh, or their family member kind of exactly what is going on. So I thought we would, uh, I thought in this lecture we would talk about the origin of the concept of psychosis um, as well as the origin of the word itself. And we'll talk about its symptoms. And I would like to very briefly um, try to give you some theories of causation that are more than just it's a neurochemical imbalance. I actually really hope to explain to you in this lecture um, how neurochemical aberrations can translate into subjective experience and behavioral changes. Uh, so that's my ambitious agenda for the next 10 minutes. Uh, so let's talk about the origin of the psychosis concept and the psychosis term. Um, and again, this going with the theme of super high level view, um, taking the very big picture, um, we didn't really have anything that's recognizable as, a psych as psychiatry until the end of the, eight, uh, the, end of the 17th century uh, during the period of enlightenment when lots of things uh, that had either had no explanation or ju just were ascribed to bad luck or fate or God or the devil um, began to you know, acquire scientific explanations. The world seemed at that time like everything was rational and had a reason. So when it came to um, this category of humans that had changes of mood, thought, or behavior that seemed um, difficult for others to understand, then rather than just thinking that such individuals were criminal, were um, degenerate, were possessed by demons and so forth, uh, it, it, the idea gained a lot of traction that what may likely be happening is that these folks are suffering from a medical disease um, whose symptoms we, whose causes we um, struggle to understand, but nonetheless, um, but we should treat them as if they have a medical illness. And, and the idea that medical illnesses exist whose causes are unknown, but nonetheless we should offer treatment was par for the course in 1790. I mean, we, we, we knew nothing of the cause of any disease yet, we also, but we had, we had treatments that were like rest and fresh air and clean water, um, a handful of uh, herbs or um, pharmaceutical agents and so forth. So the idea was to apply the same concept. Um, and then that was the beginning of uh, the psychiatric hospital and between these, in like the, the beginning of enlightenment in 1700s and mid 1900s, uh, we had large-scale psychiatric hospitals in those days called asyla, uh, at least in the English-speaking world, and, and an asylum is a place of refuge. Uh, that's the original meaning of asylum. So uh, the idea was to build these places of refuge and offer uh, good food, clean water, fresh air, um, ideally, you know, care and space and, uh, and, and refuge from stress. Um, as I think most people know, that laudable idea certainly became overwhelmed by numbers, and they became overcrowded and um, unhelpful. But the the, the original con the original concept was actually laudable for its time. 
Um, so we had, across the globe, uh, we had established all of these large-scale hospitals and the, uh, the, the superintendents or the, the um, physicians in charge of them uh, had a principal task of trying to categorize illness and, and because you can't really search for cause unless you have a way to categorize the things that you're looking for. So it was in this era that we developed the concept of psychosis, which was a, a way to describe um, a certain class of symptoms um, of, uh, let me talk, I should have done the slide in the other order. The class of symptoms that, that psychosis was meant to explain were relatively severe changes of thought and behavior. Um, and these changes in uh, thought or use of language or behavior uh, were thought to represent changes at the highest level of brain function, which in the 19th century was called psyche. Uh, I, I would love, I mean, th these terms literally are more than a century old. They're, they're well overdue for revision um, because nobody these days talks about psyche. Uh, and psyche as a word is very, is very perilous because it, 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 it latches on to meanings of soul or spirit or, you know, things that are a little bit woo-woo or difficult to define. Um, you know, but the specific meaning of psyche back in those days was, uh, and, and if we were to translate it into 21st century language, um, what they were calling psyche is highest level integrative functions of the brain. So take sensory experience from the external world or for the, from within the body, um, recognize what's happening, bring that into the sphere of self-awareness, uh, link it with memories, with association with other things, with some ability to have predictions of present information, uh, to use present information to predict certain events in the near-term future. Those are, I mean, those are the highest level outputs of the brain that we have conscious awareness of. So that's the neurological process that psyche was originally meant to describe. Um, thus, it seemed from the behaviors that people observed then and now that something was going on that interfered with those higher level integrative processes of the brain. So going back, um, as we know, itis is a suffix that denotes inflammation. So neuritis is the name of a whole family of diseases which involve um, inflammation of nerve cells, either in the periphery or in the brain. Of course, if it happens in the brain, we call it encephalitis. Um, osis is a suffix to denote abnormality without inflammation. So, um, you know, from a 19th century view, you had the diseases which were neuritides, I think is the plural for it, which, which were in the category of neuritis, but um, a lot of the behavioral changes or you know, mood, uh, mood and thought changes were thought to ha have neural, neural origins without inflammation. Thus, neurosis was coined to describe some of those. And psychosis eventually was brought into the, to the lexicon to describe um, more severe or um, disorders that didn't, uh, that, that touched on broader functions. And so that's how we got psychosis. And over the course of time, it acquired new meanings. It's being used in our language now as an adjective uh, in, a, in a kind of pejorative sense. So as I said, it's, it's uh, editorial opinion, time to probably come up with a new term. I would suggest integration disorder, but as they've done in Japan. So, uh, so when we come to the question, what is psychosis? To restate what I've said, it, it, these are, uh, psychosis is a word to describe experiences or symptoms that arise from errors of the integration of sensory processes, both from within and without the body, within and outside of the body. Um, symptoms, and, and they all really revolve around misperceptions. Um, I'll talk more at length about specifically what goes on in the misperceptions. But from misperceptions, we can have unusual beliefs, um, which uh, delusions and so forth, um, unusual perceptions, uh, hallucinations and so forth, um, inappropriate or incongruent moods or language disturbances or thought or, or um, behavioral disorganization. So um, we also know from, uh, there's no shortage of um, imaging studies um, that say that brain regions, which not surprisingly are primarily involved in sensory integration, uh, specifically temporal cortex, frontal cortex, and cingulate cortex um, are the areas that are prominently um, affected or represent the, you know, the, the pathway of disruption. So, so essentially psychosis is a neurological disorder involving temporal, frontal, and cingulate gyri um, that uh, results in aberrant 
uh, synthesis of information or integration, and that affects the highest level outputs, language, mood, behavior, and so forth. So how, how does that happen? Um, we'll talk in future lectures about dopamine. Um, I think, as most people know, aberrations in dopamine signaling are um, sit at kind of the focal point of most of the dominant theories of schizophrenia causation. Uh, dopamine is a neurotransmitter which is used in circuits that um, signal salience. So the brain has the brain has um, has a system that is devoted to what is called in cognitive science salience recognition or salience uh, demarcation. And essentially when these circuits are active, it will cause the brain, uh, brain function to switch from, from what's called default mode network uh, functioning into central executive functioning uh, to, to explain. Um, if I'm doing nothing, my brain goes into what's called default mode network. There are certain regions of the brain which become more active when I'm idle. And uh, if scientists record what, I, what I'm thinking about during this time, daydreaming, reminiscing, putting like various ideas together. So I'm, I'm you know, we, we would call it internally preoccupied. Uh, but uh, if I move into central executive functioning, I am problem solving. Different regions of the brain become active in problem solving. I'm paying attention to my environment, either to a problem on a paper or to a problem in the room, and I'm trying to use memories and engage strategies and, and use executive functioning to solve it. So I switch from, if you will, idle, idle rumination to active problem solving. And I'll do this when, when this um, salient signal has been activated. So I can, for random example, look at this microphone on the table and uh, see if it goes from red to blue, then bing, I've had a signal for salience, the microphone is on, so rather than just you know, entertain myself with internal doodles, um, I should think about organizing my sentences and thinking about what the next slide is going to say and so forth. Uh, because I recognize this, I, have the, I, I assign salience to the change of color. So salience, um, what, essentially what salience feels like is that something noteworthy has happened and I need to start thinking about it. Um, so if dopamine is prominently involved in salience circuitry, and if excessive dopamine signaling causes that circuit to fire at random or, in, or irrelevant times, then I, have, I begin to have unusual experiences. Um, so I have what is called in psychology literature aberrant salience. Um, so let's say now I'm looking at this, um, this, this drink. Um, and if, if it register a salient signal now, then I start to become very confused because, you know, I'm supposed to be focusing on this, but I need to solve the problem of that. Why is that so interesting? What about this makes it so important? So um, if, if you listen to reports of people who are experiencing initial episodes of psychosis, they'll say things like, the whole world seems different. It's like, it's just, like, everything is just meaningful or there's just, you know, it's just, it's just, the same, but it feels weird, um, and so that's that's the that's the fundamental default, the the fundamental um, process in aberrant salience theory. Uh, from then, um, you know, my central executive part, the the part of my brain that has to come up with reasons so that I can use it to predict the future or under or put this into an understanding of the past. Um, I'll begin to construct a narrative around this. Um, this this may have a magical property or there is something, or maybe maybe I've now been alerted to the fact that the, that the color of this represents poison. Um, a lot of my, again, our idea is we have to, our brain needs to protect us. So looking and scanning for danger is, is priority number one. So if I'm, I'm, if I'm attuned to that survival need, then I can recognize, I can begin to imagine that the special meaning I have about this is because this may be somehow dangerous. Um, and if I apply that to the expression on Sarah's face or to the blue light under the camera in front of me, uh, then I can construct a wider narrative that there is danger all around me. Uh, so that's how Ever Everin Salience very, very well explains um, all, all manner of delusions. I could have an alternate interpretation, an optimistic one, that um, this, this seems meaningful to me because this is divine. Uh, this has spiritual energy that I never knew it existed. And so how exciting is that, that I've heard about all these things and now I'm experiencing it. So I can, I can then look at Sarah's expression or the light of the camera as new signs of um, enlightenment 
and then I can wind up with, uh, you know, with a religious delusion or a grandiose delusion. Um, I can feel exhilarated, and feelings of, you know, such 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 delusions and exhilaration are also very common, especially early in the course of schizophrenia. Um, so then what happens if I start to have thoughts internally and, and I get salient signals from internal thoughts? Um, I'm, the, it might become so um, such a strong internal perception that that thought no longer seems like it's my own. Um, and from there, you can walk to the idea that, you know, internal speech um, is perceived as external. And then if I start to construct a sentence and I'm thinking ahead about the word cloud and cloud signals a certain salience, I may put cloud at the beginning of the sentence rather than at the end of the sentence. Um, so it, it, it begins to skew how I organize my language and thus my behavior. So um, the, the bottom line of all that is that a simple neurochemical abnormality which results in unusually high salience signals coupled with cognitive theories around how I'm going to feel about this salient signal and the narrative I'm going to construct around it, um, can actually very, very well explain most of the facets of uh, schizophrenia. And this um, helps us, I think, to explain that in ways that are going to be, um, well, provide more rational explanation than you have a genetic disease. Um, and it also helps us to a lot to, to think about treatment uh, more holistically or comprehensively. So it's great then to um, explain to somebody that, you know, things like pe when people have symptoms like you're experiencing your patient, it oftentimes is because they're having too high a level of dopamine attached to things in their world. So we have a whole bunch of options that we can use to just reduce your dopamine signaling to the right level so that the world will make sense to you as it used to. Um, but beyond that, we should explain that uh, we would like to, in to have them participate in cognitive therapies to begin to understand how um, feeling and idea and emotion are related and then um, and, and it becomes a more uh, uh, an, an opportunity to invite more robust and, and durable treatment response in my view. So that I think is the end of slides. Yes.